Stand with me as I read our passage of scripture. It's from Isaiah 55. Listen to these words. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they've watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord a memorial, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes I wish that we'd just sit with beautiful passages like these up on the screen for a while. <laughs> Maybe just let Christopher play, let Ashley play, let Jordan sing again, and just sit in this. Let it sink in. Uh, these beautiful words, these songs we sing every week, um, the experiences we have during worship. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've already been in the presence of the Lord in prayer. And then I'm supposed to get up here and say something about all this. Um, but I think sometimes I just want to soak up this rain and snow from heaven, like the passage said. Take it in with more than just a sort of passing glance so that we can get on with the next thing. Sometimes I think we're quick to do that. Um, we co don't quite know how to be still, do we? To listen and just to rest in it. Um, you know, but I imagine that some of us would be tech, uh, texting or checking Instagram within the first minute. Some of you maybe already are as soon as the song start, uh, <laughs> finished. Uh, I kind of don't doubt that, actually. That's okay. But a, a time of rest could be more disruptive than helpful because many of us are uncomfortable with stillness, aren't we? We're uncomfortable with a kind of restful reflection. We, we don't even really know how to do this, do we? It's just not something we're really taught in our culture. But some have discovered how healthy this can be, how essential for our growth, good for us spiritually, mentally, and e I mean, even physically. And the first time I preached here earlier in the year, I said something like, I don't really have anything to say. Great way to start, isn't it? Um, but it's honestly true. <laughs> uh, I went on to clarify that I'm convinced that God does have something to say and that he already has. And if I can just sort of get out of the way and point in the di right direction, maybe encourage us to hear it, then I'm doing all right. And that, that's not like a cheap attempt at humility. I mean, I deeply believe that. Um, I'm just trying to point to what God might be saying through his spirit, in the scriptures, in creation, in each other, through our testimony, and most clearly in Jesus. But every time I prepare to preach, I'm kind of at a loss, just to be honest with you. <laughs> I, uh, I study these scripture passages and just wonder, what am I supposed to add to this? Um, there's so many ideas when I'm studying, when I'm in prayer, so many connections that I'm seeing, so many concerns, so many hopes in my head, in my heart. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, Sherlock Holmes' wall of research up there, just this, these strings connecting dots on an unseen map. I mean, it's a total mess. How am I supposed to communicate any of this? I'm either in awe or confused and probably both, honestly. And it just makes me want to be still. You know what I mean? Um, I, I mean, I do want to grow in my ability to speak clearly when I'm asked to. It's part of my calling. 
Uh, I want to be able to not create any barriers to what I'm trying to communicate. I want to grow in that. But frankly, what I really want to grow in is the ability to listen. Um, And I think this includes both an active pursuit of understanding and this attempt, this ability to sort of be still and reflect that is so hard for us. I think not being able to really listen and remember or connect the dots between what we've heard is so detrimental to our growth. If we don't learn how to set aside the constant flow of distractions and just input that we're always getting, even good input, and focus really hear, then we're just on a kind of treadmill of information, aren't we? Sometimes sounds good, um, even seems spiritually helpful in the moment, but without any real transformation. Can we learn to be better listeners? Can we grow in that? You know, I listen intently to the powerful sermons of my colleagues each, each week, not to mention the preaching of the choir and the worship team and their songs. And also your testimonies, the acts of love that because of my job, I get to witness myself and hear your lives of service. Trust me, God is speaking in so many different ways. But are we listening? Do we have the capacity to really listen? Or are we just so stuck in our own narrative that we can't hear what else is going on and what he's saying? Any one of these sermons in recent weeks, let's, let's just say since Pentecost, for example, deserves to be reflected on and digested for, I don't know, a month or more without anything else added. But the next week rolls around, it's time for another great sermon. And the next week rolls around and another. And this is what we expect now, right? You just show up every Sunday, get a great sermon, hear it, check off the box and head back. But are we really receiving or retaining any of this? Or better yet, are we able to put in any of it into practice? Are we attempting that? I wonder. And I sometimes worry over what seems to be a growing inability to listen long term, you know, to really stick with it and listen, to connect the dots of what God could be saying to us through these many voices. As I said, we've heard some powerful sermons from pastors Dan, Hunter, and Greg just in the last few weeks, and there's much more in these sermons than I could condense right here. I'm not going to try and re-preach three sermons for you. But I think there have been a few things that they have all shared that connect, and I believe it's important that we try to hear this together and not let it pass by us while we're moving on to the next thing. So let me try to connect the dots for us briefly and sort of as an example of what it might mean to listen with the heart over an extended period of time. A month or so ago, Pastor Hunter taught on Paul's encouragement in Romans 5 that there are treasures that can grow from our suffering. Do you remember that? These treasures growing from suffering, endurance, which can lead to character, and character which can lead to hope. But Hunter said that we have to be present to this suffering, our suffering, in order for that process to really take root. We can't ignore it or hide it or spend all of our time running from it. In a way, we have to listen as we suffer or struggle. Then Pastor Greg preached in such a clear and fresh way on the familiar story of Abraham offering Isaac, at least almost offering him. In that sermon, he described an altar as the place our pain and our praise meet. That phrase just like loomed large in my mind. A place that begins with death, but leads to worship. A place of gain through loss. Pastor Greg even said that this wasn't his initial sermon theme, but he felt it was specifically for someone. I think it turned out to be for many if we were listening. And just last week, Pastor Dan preached on what he called the center of everything. Now that's an audacious title. But he opened up Christ's offer for us to come to him 
all of you who are weighed down with heavy burdens. Put, my, put your burdens on me. Rest in me. Learn of me. Which is certainly involves deep listening, doesn't it? If we have any hope of learning of him. In that sermon, Pastor Dan said that our places of deepest struggle may be precisely the place of transformation. Where we struggle may be the exact opportunity for our growth. He said that Christ offers to take us in no matter what shape we're in, exactly as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us exactly as we are. Now, do you see how, if, maybe if we're listening, we could be able to step back and connect things coming from these three diverse sermons and possibly hear a larger message that God could be trying to get through to us over a period of time? Could we hear him asking if we're willing to quit hiding our pain? I mean, at least from him. You're not doing a very good job of hiding it from him, even if you think you are. Maybe even hiding it from ourselves, from each other. Can we open our ears to God's voice within our struggles? Can we put our pride or fear on the altar and let pain bring its gift of vulnerability? We don't quite see that as a gift, do we? It is. What if we were a people who suffered differently than others, saw our own struggles, even our temptations and our failures, the parts that we're most ashamed of as opportunities to listen and to grow, even an offering of worship to God? Could God be trying through these various voices to get this message through to us? I mean, I, I give it to you, maybe if we're listening. Now in the passage we read, remember that, that passage we read? <laughs> the prophet Isaiah speaks of God's word, accomplishing his purpose, succeeding in what he sent it to do. And the prophet uses the poetic language of heaven watering the earth and giving seed to the sower. Does that, does that imagery sound familiar? It should because surely Jesus had this prophecy in mind centuries later when he told his parable of the soils. And that's our gospel passage today in Matthew 13. I want to read it just to catch everyone up. Read it briefly. And he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth in their soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Still other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. It's a famous parable, and it's not quite as mysterious as some of Jesus' others because just a few verses later, he actually takes his disciples aside and explains the whole thing to them. His parable tells of a sower going out to spread seed, which he later explains to be the word of the kingdom. And this seed or word falls on the famous four symbolic types of soil. So let's go through them really quickly by way of review. Some falls by the path and the birds come and eat it. These birds are identified by Jesus as the evil one, stealing the word that is not understood by the hearer. That's sober stuff, stealing it because we're not list really listening or understanding. Let me ask you, if the birds can come and pick the seed up right off the ground, what does that tell you? It didn't sink in at all. It's just right there on the surface. I get the picture with this type of seed of kind of a in one ear and out the other, right? No reflecting on what was shared, not listening in a way that leads to understanding and snatched away. Some seed falls on rocky ground where there isn't much good rich soil and plants spring up quickly, but when the heat comes, they wither just as quickly 
because there's no depth for them to take root. Maybe this could be characterized as superficial hearing. Jesus says the soil receives the word quickly and even with joy. But as soon as struggle arises, they wither, they fall back, they abandon what they've heard. Again, no continued listening that understands, grows, and leads to the potential for transformation. An immature or surface level of hearing, maybe. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and smothered it. And this soil, I think, has the potential for growth. They hear the word, but the cares of the world and the desire for wealth choke it. The capacity to hear is great with this type, I believe. But they're listening to lots of things. And rather than continue hearing and growing in the words of the kingdom, they're distracted and become concerned more with their own kingdom building. Finally, there's what Christ calls the good soil that takes in the seed and grows good, healthy grain in various returns. Listen to the language Jesus uses to describe this good soil. He says, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. That's how he describes them. It's this soil that bears fruit. This is the type of listening that leads to wisdom, an applied and transformative kind of understanding. Not in one ear, out the other, not sort of superficially on the surface, and not just having the potential to hear, but getting distracted with so many other things. It sinks in. Now, at the end of the parable, Jesus uses a phrase that he apparently really liked because he uses it a lot, both in the Gospels and post-resurrection, when he's speaking to the seven churches in the Revelation. What is it? Anyone that has ears, let them hear. You know, my Sunday school teacher used to do this with us. Got ears? He's talking to you. So this listening soapbox I'm on is not just a pet subject for me, though I, you know, we preach about what we need. I need this. But I think I'm on pretty solid ground here in emphasizing its importance. Jesus' phrase here kind of reminds me of something my mom would say, and I doubt she was the only one who said it. Guess what it was? Did you hear me? <laughs> Did you hear me? Now, I would, of course, respond, yes, or depending on her tone, yes, ma'am. Uh, but can anyone guess what came after this? What was her follow-up to me saying, yeah, I heard you? What did I say? <laughs> now, there are two responses to this. Both of them are problematic. You already knew, know you're in a no-win situation. The first response is, uh, it doesn't do you any good. Or sometimes I could actually recite right back to her, word for word, what she said. And to my shock, this didn't help either. Because clearly I'd heard it, but I wasn't doing it. <laughs> so either way, I'm done. And she would always say, you may have heard me, but you weren't really listening. She saw this as some kind of disobedience for some reason. <laughs> Apparently, Jesus feels similarly. Now, I think most of us see the potential for all these types of soil in ourselves. Perhaps at different periods of our lives, we've been these various types, and we can see it clearly. Or maybe, depending on our moods, we could be anyone at any time. But how can we cultivate ears to be that soil that really hears, understands, takes in with depth? How can we be the kind of listeners that hear some similar themes in a series of seemingly unrelated sermons, but in prayer, let that message take root and yield good things in our lives, maybe even change us, which is the miracle of all miracles. Now, first of all, we've got to realize that we're kind of playing with a stacked deck here because Jesus tells his parable and then ends with this statement about having ears to hear, but then he cheats. He takes his disciples behind the scenes and privately explains it all to them anyway. 
And before we start really, you know, getting into comparisons, these disciples were not perfectly faithful in any way. They just followed him around like puppies or maybe sheep, or as he calls them, little children. That's what it means to be his follower. You just follow Jesus around. And he takes them aside. He initiates. I'm going to explain to you the things that are maybe beyond you. I'm going to tell you what I mean. Now, I'm convinced he is still in the business of doing that through the spirit that he promised and gave us. This is one of the reasons we put together things like this daily prayer, prayer devotional for you. It's just a little thing we tried to put together because we want to help you create the space in your everyday lives to listen for the Holy Spirit, who we absolutely believe is still leading us into truth. Um, if you didn't grab one of these, we have them at our information desk, and you can download the PDF from our website. But the ch church efforts like this are about encouraging us to listen and internalize God's word in prayer to create space and expectation to hear because he's still speaking in so many ways. And I think we've forgotten that prayer is about listening first and it's probably mostly about listening anyway. I mean, in any conversation, isn't it wise to listen to the more informed party? When I go visit the doctor after I'm you know, done whining about what's wrong with me, then it's my business to listen. I want to know what he has to say about my problems. You know, uh, on a plane, when the pilot starts speaking through the intercom, everybody is quiet <laughs> because it's important you hear what the pilot's going to say when you're <laughs> up in the air. That's who you want to hear, right? My wife suggested I shouldn't insert something about spouses here. <laughs> so being wise, I've done that. Um, and I'd love to go on so much more with it, Jess, but just time won't allow me. I just can't go any further with it. I'm sorry. But in prayer, who is the more informed party? I mean, why would prayer be any different? Unless we're treating it as a magic trick, unsure if anyone else is on the other line, unaware that it's a conversation. What if we entered prayer by listening before speaking? It's timely to discuss these things in this season after Pentecost, a season that lasts for the rest of the Christian year. You'll notice that after Pentecost, the colors in the sanctuary have turned to green, the table and the crosses. And they're going to stay that way pretty much until Advent begins, the entire second half of our year. Some people call this, because of the colors, the green season, the time when good things grow. And according to Christ and Isaiah, growth involves really listening that we're talking about, that I'm going on and on about, probably wearing out your capacity to listen with my talk about listening. That's the way it goes. Receiving this rain and snow from heaven and letting it soak in, letting the words of the kingdom sink down deep within us. I mean, what's the point of sermons, of any doctrine, of ideas really, if they don't lead us to wisdom? It takes a little time and attention for things to really imprint on us. I'm not sure we give it that. If we just give even really powerful experiences, nothing more than a passing response, even if it's an enthusiastic passing response, before long, we'll just quickly reframe it and adapt it back into our old paradigm, right back into our old way of doing things. If we don't give it time to sink in, there's no potential for change or growth here. So I want to encourage you to participate in this good green season. Open our ears. Let's be the type of soil that soaks in the word when it's watered. The passage from Isaiah is such a wonderful passage for the green season. And I know I've only referenced it in passing. But let's listen again, quick, briefly, and consider Christ's parable and what God may be saying to you. Let's listen to our passage one more time as I prepare to close. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they've watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the hearer, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, 
but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, do you see how everything is transformed when his word goes out and accomplishes its purpose? The earth is watered, the soil soaking in it. Think about the Lord's parable. What were barren and rocky places in this prophecy are mountains and hills bursting with song. Where there were thorns choking out the word, here, Instead of thorns and briars, there are cypress and myrtles springing up. We don't have to remain the same soil that we most seem to relate to right now. We can grow. We can be changed if we will simply and steadily listen with the heart. Whatever our circumstances are, listen to them and listen to what God may be saying. You know, I didn't go into the context of of Isaiah's prophecy, um, I, there just wasn't time and it wasn't really the focus of what I thought we needed to hear. But I wonder how many of his original listeners who had experienced great loss and pain, by the way, learned to believe in this God who wanted to comfort them and lead them home through the way of pain, struggle, loss, even death. And then this God went through this himself in Jesus to ensure us that death provides the only opportunity for rebirth. If we'll risk it. Going through loss in order to find renewal. Surrendering so that we can receive. This is the gospel. There's no other way but the way of Jesus who suffers with us. He promises, though, sorrow will eventually turn to dancing. The psalmist says, we'll go out in joy and return in peace as creation echoes our praises. Will we accept this promise? Be present to our suffering. Listen as we struggle and grow in the opportunities this season provides.